and welcome to the sanctuary a safe space to speak from the heart my guest today is somebody i've been dying to talk to super talented Osinedi. Osinedi? Yeah. yes <laughs> yes <laughs> thanks for coming to the sanctuary today thank you so much as we've talked before you know i've been really really excited to be a part of this we've wanted to do this for a little while but with you know life throws its time with time management and things like that not being able to chat so i'm really happy to be here and super excited to see all the things you're doing yeah no thanks thanks um i mean you know I, i'm going to do a little bit of time travel but i want to start in the most recent version of what's happening now in your life uh uh greed just dropped uh yep. let's talk about greed what's the story there no and, and what was your process for making it Absolutely. So yeah, I, I said a little bit earlier that I had a little bit of inspiration from a couple movies. So one for me, the biggest one was Scarface. Um, the other one for me for greed is just like my own life of like dealing with kind of different situations of like not understanding, you know, I get to a level, let's say as a DJ or clout or fame or whatever it kind of is. And then being like, okay, what's next? And not like sitting and like celebrating like where I've gotten and things like that. So greed for me, like I consider it, I actually call them like the idea of this project called ego deaths that like each sin we kind of do. Like if you think about all the sins that they are, there's seven of them and like we all kind of do them in times of our lives and not even realize we're doing them. So mm. greed for me, which is the idea of like in Scarface, like the power, the money, the fame, the, the drugs, the everything. And it's like, he had everything going for him and he was never, it was never good enough. So I really took that into consideration. And I really thought about, there's like a photo of him where he has like a bunch of gold and like, I think it's like drugs in it too, but he's sitting there and I think he's like smoking a cigarette and he looks so depressed. And that was like the image for me, you know, for greed. I was like, that is what I want greed to feel like. And I'm working with the sound of it and things like that. But I also kind of wanted it to be something that sounded a little bit over the top and everywhere and kind and big because it's like if you think you might see him on the surface that everything is cool and everything's fine but then in your head in that kind of like uh idea like how you're thinking it's just everywhere you're a mess like you're not able to like construct your thoughts correctly and like yeah and all that kind of stuff so that's kind of what i was going with that one yeah and like um when it comes to you have this idea in your head you, mm -hmm. you i mean you already have this concept album going with the mm -hmm. seven scenes and now you're working on grid uh how do you take that idea from your head to you know to to the world uh like what software do you use when you're working on your music so i as i said earlier was that there's like always people have different arguments and things like that for how, what softwares they use i use um for uh production i use logic it, it's i have a macbook and it works really well for me for me i find the other versions i had a hard time seeing how things work like i have contacts in right now and i wear glasses so being able to actually be able to see all the lines make sure everything's timed correctly i like logic the best because of the colors of it and how you can make everything colorful and and pretty and things like that and i i really i really like the organization of it um sometimes i jump on ableton because i do find some of the some of the software like in this it's called a plugin so where some of the sounds uh, come from I find that I like Ableton's sounds a little bit better for electronic music so I kind of go back and forth um, I work at a studio and do those kind of things also but I really enjoy logic um, and you know I find like the biggest thing for me is using different music videos or movies or listening to other artists and getting inspo from what they're making and how you feel in it like electronic music I find you can like close your eyes listen to the music and you're like getting these visions of like different things you're going through, like a cinematic story. And that's what I love about electronic music. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so Ableton. Oh, wait, you know, you were just mentioning this thing. It's crazy. YouTube every time. Well, not every time, but most times when I open a YouTube video, the very first thing that comes up is this plugin called like an ad for a plugin called Drip. I don't know if you mm -hmm. know of this, but like. Well, I'm like, I don't know anything about music or production. Why are you showing me this? Anyway, um, what are some of the plugins you use? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think one of the best ones that I think of for when I'm using music is if you are like just starting, let's say electronic music and you need a plugin to actually use, for me, um, Serum. Like if you're going into electronic music, you gotta get Serum. Um, there's also like default plugins like on um, your different softwares and different kind of synthesizers that you can use. Um, mm -hmm. Alchemy is this plugin that I actually use all the time because like the thing is is that I have like started sounds that literally have no sounds on it. Like it's like a little ticking noise or like nothing. And I've made it into this fat bass or this fat synth and you can grow it by mm -hmm. using different kinds of plugins. So that's what I use. I also have Waves, which has been, it has everything you need. It has reverbs, it has um, compressors, it has all these different kinds of like systems and plugins in it to really grow your kind of sound. And for me, I didn't technically go to school for actual music production, but I did learn music theory from playing instruments. So for me, I really use my ear to understanding how to make a sound sound good. Sometimes I don't even know what the plugin is and I'm like, sure, let's try this one and see what it does. And then I kind of just go from there. F Waves has like, you open it and it has like, I would say like this much of like different kind of plugins that you can use when yeah. as like a thing. And you're like, uh, where do I start? Um, but Waves <laughs> is really, yeah. Waves is really good to use. Um, if you're looking for other ones for uh, for your DAW, it's called Fab Filter. I really enjoy it also just for a, a limiter. I use that for a limiter, um, a compressor also, and things like that. It just kind of, it all depends on your preferences. And uh, another a great thing if you're looking, because you, know, you can create a whole sound just from original sounds, but especially with electronic music, like if you think of it as like in your DAW or your, let's say Logic, um, you will have, in rap music, there's probably, like, we'll call them tabs is what we'll think of them as. Like, if you're opening a window tab on your laptop. In uh, rap music, there can be maybe, like, four to ten tabs open. But on electronic music, for different kind of sounds, there can be, like, 40 to 100. So trying <laughs> to create all the, right? Like, it's, it's crazy. And But it doesn't make one harder to make or one easier to make. They're all, it varies in different ways of, like, how, which one's harder to make or easier. But mm -hmm. I find uh, with different kinds of all those different kind of tabs, you know, making all original sounds from all those kind of things, you mm -hmm. kind of lose an inspiration because you only have so many areas that you can find a certain sound or make a certain sound. Mm -hmm. um, if let's say you're not good at making drums or things like that, you know, there's an app called Splice where you have a bunch of samples and things like that that you can take that are royalty free. You're barely paying anything. I think I pay $13 a month for them and I get a thousand samples just from there. And oh, if you're wow. looking, yeah, it's awesome. And you're looking at maybe getting, like for me, I might look at using like 10 to 20 different samples, let's say, in, in this kind of idea of a song and then kind of going from there. But I think people think, you know, sometimes you have to spend all this freaking money on like plugins and all these kind of things. And then your laptop has no memory. You don't know what to do, all this kind of stuff. So, you know, there's default programs that are already in the in logic and things like that, that you have the capability of using that you can grow your music in such cool ways. Like I literally I would pull up one of these songs and show you in the sense of what and I've done it in my stories to be like, OK, I've used these five plugins. This is mm -hmm. what the sound sounded now. It was like silent, like it made this kind of like do, do, do kind of noise and now I made it into this fat like loud bass sound and it, it's crazy that like you can literally create nothing into something so big and beautiful like it, it, it's a really cool thing to be able to do um mm. but there's always a lot of learning like even for me there's times that I get kind of stuck and I'm like okay where do I want to go now and I'll just jump on YouTube and watch someone else like produce music and I'll go jump on a logic and I was like oh, we have a synthesizer like that? I didn't even know I had that on Logic. And then I jump back in, learn it, and like create a different sound from something else. So it's really cool. Writing music has been a really cool thing to be able to do. And I, I really want, especially, you know, guys do it, girls do it. You know, it doesn't matter who you are. You can all jump in and do it. But I think mm -hmm. I would love more women to be doing it because we are very creative. When women are very intuitive and creative people that you know, it's a really good outlet to getting emotions out and getting what you need out. Like sometimes I've been really ticked off about something and I make this like angry sounding dubstep song. Um, and sometimes it's not even like a song yet. It's not even a range. It's just like, 
I'm mad. I'm making this loud sound. And then just like doing that. And it's like a mess, but I'm at least getting those emotions out. And then I can like recreate the one I want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you were talking about waves. A friend of mine that does like all most of my audio, uh, just introduced me to waves the other day. I was like, Oh, what is this? Uh, and the only thing I use is a noise field noise. Yes. NS1. Yeah, NS1. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's the only thing I use. I use it like if I record something, it's like, you know, background noise. I just take it out. It's like magic. I don't know how it works, but it works. <laughs> so, so, so many cool how long did it. it take to. Yeah? Lo I would like you just play with waves. If you have it, just like make a sound, like use a piano, let's say, and then go through waves and try all the different options that you have and you'll make so many different unique things. Yeah, really cool. no, music isn't my thing. Here's yeah. the thing, <laughs> I, have a, I have an ear for music. Like, mm -hmm. I know what is going to be a hit. I just know it. But making it, no. I don't have the skills. I can't play any instruments. I can't sing. Yeah. But I can tell when something is going to be good. I That's, just kind of have the ear yeah. for it. Uh, but making it, uh, no. <laughs> I just leave it's, that for people that do it. It's interesting, too, because, like, making it is, like, a whole other thing. you got to have, like, the drive to do it, too. Because sometimes you're like, well, this Netflix show is lit. Like, I'm going to sit and watch this Netflix. <laughs> but then sometimes I have to, like, even push myself to, like, get going and get writing and things like that. And it's been a learning curve to, like, get my time management right and not mm -hmm. be like, oh, I'll watch another episode of this show. But then I'm like, no, get <laughs> up, get going, get writing. Because you only, you how your ears work, you can only, you know, do it so much. And if you're listening to music, if you're r watching movies, you know, in, in a day, you should be right away, you know, get your music out and do that and then go into that kind of stuff is what I've learned. I've kind of flipped it around so that <laughs> so something I've had to learn. How did it start for you, like, you know, because you have, like, a guitar behind you, but, like... Learning you are, guitar. Oh, oh, you're learning. <laughs> yeah, I'm oh, learning okay. guitar, so, yeah. How this did music start for yeah. you, though? Music started for me, so that's a great question. Um, I would actually say for music, for me, started with becoming a dancer, and I'll say that, and I'll explain in a little bit why. So I started mm. dancing when I was three years old. Then my parents... What's our dance, like, ballet and stuff? So I did, oh gosh, okay, so ballet, lyrical, jazz, tap, Irish dance, and then I was really in Irish dance for a really long time, because uh, my family, my mom is Egyptian heritage, but I also have a little bit, I have a lot of Irish, um, and with that being said, I had a lot of time and effort to like learn Irish because of like my family and things like that, but I've done probably every single kind of dance that is out there, I've shuffled, I've done hip hop, um, I performed as a in Walt Disney World a lot as a dancer. So um, with that, wait, my, wait, 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 wait. Sorry, say that last part again. Yeah. Um, so I was a Walt Disney World performer. So it kind of started in a weird way when I was a kid, where I would just go with my family, and uh, it was all like they loved Disney World, and I learned a lot about performance from being in Disney because those are like some of the top performers that you, you can even meet and you don't realize that they're like secret performers that will go work in Disney and some of them like one of my best friends that was in the Moroccan pavilion his name's Archie Penna um he was Shakira's producer for a long time and wrote hips don't lie but he's performing in Disney World you know and he's you wouldn't you don't expect those kind of things but you know they're top class performers and things like that and I was performing as a belly dancer at that time um at the Moroccan pavilion with him and I, at that time, there was even moments that I wasn't even performing. We didn't even know each other at this point. And um, he, for some reason, me and Archie like saw each other. And I just kind of started like belly dancing, like in the crowd. And we like looked at each other and it was like this weird intuitive thing of like, you need to come up here and perform. And it was just like <laughs> that, that I like jumped up. I was just a guest at Disney at that time. And mm -hmm. I was performing when I wasn't even like actually supposed to be performing at the time, even though other times I was there for performing. And uh, I was literally like, I still had like the Disney band wrist, you know, I couldn't even go backstage with them, but like I would go and he's like, you need to be here at this time, every single day, come perform with us as long as you're here. And he has been my biggest mentor. I think he's won three to four Grammys, things like that. Nice. And he knows it's just someone that in this this industry can be really tricky in the music industry. There's a lot of politics. There's a lot of different kind of things. 
So having people like him in my, in your life as a musician, you can learn a lot about how the music industry actually works and what's going on. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I was performing for seven years in Irish dance at a place called Raglan Road. It's like a in downtown Disney and it's a bar club kind of situation. And, you know, um, a lot of people ask me, they're like, which uh, city was this? Florida? Or? Orlando. Yeah, Florida or Kissimmee or whatever. It's kind of a little bit out of Florida. Yeah, um, yeah. I yeah. think I was there. <laughs> yeah, it's Is so that the one that has the and is it NBA? Like does he have like No, 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 no. Sorry, but... I'm thinking of Disney Springs. Never mind. Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah. So Disney Springs is technically what downtown Actually, yeah, it's changed. So it's like Disney Springs is become what downtown Disney is now, oh. but yeah. So It's really cool. It's they've made it a little bit more of like a shopping kind of area. But then yeah, go, yeah. There's a, like a yeah. sex soleil there and stuff. Yep. Yeah. yeah. The That's literally awesome. the last place I went before the pandemic. But never mind. Let's We're go on. Like you had a go. job there. Why would you like, it, I mean, it seems pretty mm-hmm. cool. What made it you is. say, oh, I'm done. I'm. Um, you know, I think it was just for me. It was that I, I wanted to do different, different things. At that time, I wasn't DJ. Um, and I also gave to Halifax to go to university. So I found at that time, I also was, it's kind of funny because like a lot of people, like they kind of look at me and they're like, you just released music and this person heard it and you're not freaking out. And I'm like, yeah, but I've been performing since I was three years old. Like I'm pretty sure when, and it's still like an excitement for me, but it's been ingrained in my brain that there was actually times, like I had dance parents and there were literal times that like at Raglan Road that I didn't want to like perform and I because I was just tired of performing so much and doing those kind of things that I was like crying in the bathroom like things like that just not wanting to do it and I it's Mm. not that it wasn't like anything like that it's just that when you are performing so much and like people don't talk about that kind of side of the touring and that side of those kind of things that it is like a lot on you sometimes so Mm. and I was young like I I think like my first time I performed, I was like in front of like 3,000 people in Calgary. And that was like, I was a child. And so that was like something like I already did in my head, which is Mm -hmm. awesome because it helps me now when I'm performing in big crowds that I really want to be different. And I really, I love writing music, but my biggest aspect of things that I love is creating, well now especially, um, is creating a huge show. Like, what can I do if I have like a stage and it's big, let's say, or if it's this small or things like that, what can I add to the performance? That's not just me standing there and DJing and kind of going like this. Like I kind of, (laughs) you know, um, I really want to add more aspects to it. Like I have now a full plan for my next performances because COVID happened. Then I was like, you know, what can I do to amp up my performances? And it's like this whole idea with symbolism and like dark and light energy and and dancers and things like that that I really want to bring to the table when I perform but I wouldn't be able to do these kind of things and think like that if I didn't spend all that time performing Mm -hmm. um which is really cool so what got me why I say you know dancing got me into the music and DJ world is if I wasn't a dancer I don't think I would actually be considered the DJ I am now where the technical, the technicalities of, of DJing as I do now, because my timing, people even look to me and they're like, can you do, well, how can you time things like that? And it's because in my head, I'm always going one and two and three and four. And like, because of dance that I can mm-hmm. literally, I can I think of it like I, as when I'm dancing, when I'm DJing, that it's like the same timing. So if I, the years of dancing has made it really easy for me when, you know, you hit cue and press your next song, People look at me and they're like, I don't even have to have my headphones on. And I know the timing already of that kind of song. And, Mm -hmm. you know, being the age I am and things like that, it kind of, you know, it kind of made people not. I think there's a little bit of times people felt kind of they're like, whoa, how how can you DJ like that? Or how can you do that? And things like that. But I put a lot of time and effort to learn um, Mm -hmm. how to DJ because I do I do kind of get a little bit ticked off sometimes when I see the DJs that are out there playing, they can be huge and things like that, but they haven't actually like done anything on the board or they're not actually DJing. They're kind of just pressing play, playing like a full <laughs> song and then standing like this. And I'm like, DJing's an instrument, you know, you got to learn your instrument. It's like playing the clarinet, the piano, things like that. And I find that hard for me sometimes 
to watch people doing that. Sometimes I've kind of pulled away from the Twitch live streams or pulled away watching others and things like that because of just, it kind of makes me upset that if I'm sitting, you know, putting this effort in and I want everyone to kind of be putting their effort in when they're DJing and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. But dancing really helped me kind of have that capability. Um, but when it came to writing music, I started in band when I was around, uh, I think I was like 10. It was like grade six is what I remember. So I was playing clarinet. I played a little bit of percussion and I was in music theory and learning those kind of things until I was 16 and then high school hits. And if anybody knows high school and how awful kids can be to other people, you know, I was bullied. I remember there was days that I just did not, my grade 12 year, I, I was like the goody two shoes kid, you know, leadership kid, all those kind of things. And the bullying happened and then I stopped caring. I stopped going to school. like all those kind of things because I really cared about the music and I just didn't like the feeling. I was too empathetic that it was like, I hated how everyone talked about each other. I hated all those kind of things, but I didn't realize, you know, even in the adult world, that kind of life happens, but you just have mm. to maneuver yourself out of it. Um, so yeah, I started writing music in a way for me at 16, just to be able to kind of like not deal with like the bullying and things like that. And I remember at like 16, 17, I would be sitting there like kind of meditating and listening to music and like programming my own ideas and my what I would do and like and things like that. But even back then, like I didn't wasn't sure I was going to make it a career. I actually ended up quit. I quit dancing and I wasn't uh, in I was a, com a competitive dancer also. And that has a lot of pressure. You're doing like eight to 10 hour days. And I, I, you know, I was like an Eastern Canadian dance champion and I was like all those kind of things. And, you know, that was part of it also that if you won that, you'd be able to go perform in Disney World. And I, I think I won it with with a group and also as a soloist, uh, like seven years in a row that it was like, but the actual pressure, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why are people still competing? Like, if I, if I, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. The competition side of it is mess. Like you are competing for eight hours a day. You know, you're in Moncton and it was one of the places I would go uh, compete for the Eastern Canadians and just how people were and how mean some of the dancers could be. You know, we beat these girls that were performing and they blamed us for beating them because we moved their shoes because they were doing like a switch from Highland dance to uh, step dance and like putting hard shoes, those clacky tap shoes on. And I remember sitting there and they were like, you moved our shoes. Like, that's why you won. Like all this kind of stuff. We were like all standing there being like, we didn't do anything. Like we were mm -hmm. just here. And so the competitive side of things are crazy. And it's a lot of energy to like put your effort out onto that. And I was doing that. And then even in high school, I learned the whole partying aspect. And, you know, I was in Prince Edward Island, a small town. And I have to say, we all really enjoy to, you know, listen to music, dance, have parties and things like that. And mm -hmm. I really enjoyed that aspect of the music and dancing. Like I always kind of think of like how Paris Hilton was and she would love to go to the club just to hear the music and dance. But I never knew for me that I could actually make a career and command a crowd, you know, mm -hmm. for a party. But I also learned the hard aspects of that kind of party lifestyle and how it can really affect you. I think it's a huge issue sometimes, you know, and all those kind of things. But I, yeah, so I started writing music at 16 and I had all these kind of people from in the dance world, um, from where I was performing with Disney World and things like that, that kind of were mentors and in my life and things like that. But I didn't yet have that confidence to really grow myself as a brand. It wasn't until... I think I was like 18 is when I finally got into the music industry. But then I noticed how I went to my first festival. I went to Evolve and Future Forest and like different things like that. And um, was like, whoa, I could be a DJ. Like this <laughs> would be sick. But I noticed how at many of these festivals, and it's not like anyone's fault. It's literally that there's not that many women in the industry that I'd be there and be like, why are there so many guys playing? Like we need, mm. why is there like no women up here? So that was like a big kind of thing for me to be like, it was a big revelation that I had when I was like 18. It was kind of a, a weird one, you know, I was kind of with friends 
there may have been my first time doing psychedelics a part of it and I like sat while I was on it and I just had this huge brain thing that I was like you need to be a DJ you need to do this and you need to change the industry and I was like the next day from that trip I guess I downloaded I didn't have a DJ controller so I downloaded an app and it was just like two turntables and I just started mixing and it just it was crazy that I watch how the universe will unfold for you if you found like your purpose and what you want to do and you want to work at it mm -hmm. um when it came to music I actually didn't because I was young I didn't understand the idea that if you, you know you can be a DJ but it's really important to also be a producer so I was still producing tracks and things like that but I also had a hard time sometimes and it, it's something I do want to talk about how women can get really sexualized sometimes and how being in the studio with with different people how uh people can treat you and I I you know I listen to sometimes some really toxic not good people in my life that said we're gonna make you famous and we're gonna make you do this and we're gonna do this and it ended up really traumatizing me and not making a really good area in my life that I actually quit writing music just because it was really traumatizing for me and I wasn't a really good thing for me and it wasn't until some of the people locally here that actually kind of helped me get back into doing that it was being like you know you can't let that happen you can't let you know those kind of situations you know take away from that so I actually stopped writing music for about a year and a half two years and it wasn't till I was like I think I was 20 that I finally got back into it but it was even to the point that it wasn't that I didn't want to do it it just kind of scared me from like the experiences that I had but then I realized I was like oh if I stop what's going to happen to other women so I was like you know I'm doing this I'm going to, you know, be the artist that I want to be and all those kind of things. So I, I think writing music for me is a, a place for a creative outlet, but it's become more to me in the sense of wanting it to be, if it's locally, if it's international, you know, wherever I'm going in this world, you know, I let the universe do what it's going to do. I want to have a place for women and women of color and women in general that just need to have an outlet and need and want it to be a strong place for them. I want to fight for their rights. I want them to not feel uncomfortable. I want all those kind of things. And, you know, I want to work with different kind of singers and I want to work, you know, as much as I'm doing dubstep now, I've done rap and pop and things like that. And I want to be able to make a comfortable experience for any woman, if it's a singer, rapper, DJ, producer, you know, who's writing mm. music. And that's kind of more of the aspect for me. And, um, I also really want to bring into the DJ world um, something that I've been talking to Archie about that I've noticed like at the Grammys and at VMAs and all these huge performances. I'm like, why aren't there any DJs playing? Like why, you know, there's like singers and things like that, but we have no, mm -hmm. like the electronic side of things, there's not very many DJs performing at these kind of things. So I, my biggest thing is making areas and wanting to make a big project to talk to these people and get more of the electronic side and the DJ world, you know, into the mainstream and things like that. And mm. it's a big project and I know that, but it's something that I really want to bring. But I also want DJs, you know, to, for me, especially when I cut, when it comes to performances and things like that, to really bring a really different idea and it did not just like, just on the decks, you know, to have dancing, to have singing, to have a storyline you know all those kind of things I really love creative content art as I'm doing the seven deadly sins and each you know six to seven months I want to like switch it up change it and you know do those all those kind of things but yeah that's my rant <laughs> <laughs> oh wow okay so I'm gonna take all that and then break it up and try to unpack it um so you you went to the festival went on this trip and like okay i want to dj downloaded mm -hmm. the thing so let's let's break that part down you downloaded that app then what happened oh gosh i have to remember all this so i downloaded an app and i just kind of like started um just messing around with it and learning it mm -hmm. and i would sit i it was like the next day i had this big revelation and then the next day i was doing it and at that time I was still 18, so I couldn't go to the bars and clubs. Um, and I was kind of like, okay, well, I 
really, really want to DJ. How do I get interconnected to people that I want, you know, to do this with? So I ended up at school meeting someone that I told him, I was like, yeah, I want to be a DJ. I really want to DJ. And he's like, come with me. And I ended up, it was really random, but I ended up in this Brad house and I'm sitting being like, where am I? What is going on? Did I just do this sort of stupid thing? Like, what am I doing? But it actually ended up being awesome because I started DJing at this frat house. And, um, but upstairs, there was a studio. And it was a group of people called the Official Night Owls. And I got interconnected with them. And they're awesome. Katose, uh, Moonwalker, they're awesome. They make Afrobeat to, uh, I believe it's Afrobeat, R&B, all those kind of different sounds. And it actually got me into a really cool area of music that I got to learn. And he introduced me to some really cool people like i got to work at that time with yogi the producer that is a, an amazing producer that works with so many different people like drake rapper different uh, rappers like that and uh he was a, also someone that became a really good friend with me and what kind of got me going especially locally um you know was working with him and then i started doing music videos for him so i started acting in the music videos for his him music who? um official night owls so oh, okay. um yeah they uh they're a really cool crew and uh they they were performing at evolve and different kinds of things like that and i was working with them for like a year and a half i would be at that studio like i it was kind of funny is that i ended up being living in dorm my dorm room becoming a storage room. And I was literally <laughs> at this frat every single day working yeah. on music. And it was a really cool, uh, inspiring kind of time. And I look back and watch the music videos and I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I did these. Like, and, uh, he, you know, it was another two people in my life that I consider as, you know, older, but mentors that really taught me a lot. But also, you know, we did work on events. We did work on a lot of content. And things like that but it was kind of that t that time period that i would i was writing music but i wasn't really releasing anything i wasn't working with like i was working with people but it was more that i was like in the background i was kind of in my head they were great but then i ended up working with people that weren't as great and all those kind of things and they were always on my side and they always even to this day we're not we talk we try to get together but we're so busy i think official night also crew goes to um toronto a lot and comes back and forth and you know we kind of do different kind of music so it's just trying to reconnect and things like that but i that was probably the biggest thing that kind of got me going in that kind of world and then it was like the next year i started going to festivals and people started noticing me because of the official night owls um videos but i think what was the biggest thing for me at those festivals and getting into the music scene was how people noticed me was that when I was at a festival one day, it was pouring rain and I was just so happy to be there. It was Sunday and it was at Evolve. And I remember it's like the best moment of my life that I just was by my, my friends were with dancing with me, but I was just on some other level. I don't know what I was doing, but I ended up performing. Like I wasn't even performing at this festival yet. Um, and I was just dancing like, and I mean like full professional, just, would not stop dancing for like four hours and a bunch of even like the headliners would come up to me and be like who are you like what like they're like what is going on and i don't even know what was going on but i was like in a whole other world and um mm -hmm. it was that i think that was like the moment for me that i started realizing that i i had an energy to perform and that even though i've done years of performing you know my confidence even with that wasn't up to where it is now and that was like the moment for me that I actually got asked after that, just not even didn't apply for the festivals, weren't performing at the festivals, just going to learn and educate myself about how these festivals work, how to get apart, you know, all those kind of things um, that they I got invited up on stage to perform. And it was just like that. And I was backstage and I'm meeting and knowing some of the biggest Canadian headliners in the electronic music scene from just sitting not caring and dancing and that's I want that to be an aspect for anyone is just to let loose sometimes and you never just be yourself like never you never know who you're gonna meet when you're just being yourself and mm -hmm. even my friends talk about it they were like that was amazing like they were like we don't know <laughs> what you were doing what level you were on but you were it was pouring rain like it was like the sun was coming up at times and pouring in and I'm just smiling and dancing in the rain. And wow. 
it was it was amazing and I will never forget that moment because it really it brought me to a lot of friends and people would come up to me even now they'd be like do you remember that like you were killing it <laughs> and I was like I do and that was like one of those moments for me that I will always remember um I think the biggest thing that kind of got me into the scene was um social media I think it's kind of for anyone is just like working on your social media I did public relations in school so I, I was really lucky to kind of learn how social media works marketing works and things like that and uh it kind of just went from there and kind of kept growing um but yeah yeah <laughs> but like I mean so how do you go from I mean, okay, so you dance. I'm guessing you're on stage with the headliners dancing, right? You are not playing mm -hmm. music. So yeah. how do you go from there to playing music? Uh, playing music for me was getting in was, that's, I don't really, I think it was social media for me and always being willing to like, you know, reach out to different kind of people, talk to different people and just kind of getting involved with the music scene. Uh, and mm. That's what kind of got me going. And I also, in a sense, had a bunch of connections, you know, around around the world. And that was something that I was always really lucky, but I, I didn't yet understand that with these connections, I had the grasp that I could literally message someone and be like, hey, you should perform. Why aren't you performing? Or I would message them and be like, can I come and perform? Can I do this? Can I do that? Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of just kept growing from there and I started, I, it started off for me performing at my local uh, university pub at uh, Mount St. Vincent. And then people started seeing videos of me. People started seeing me as a DJ and things like that. And then it kind of just went from there. And I started playing at uh, different bars around the city and then uh, playing at Future Forest and Evolve and, and different kinds of things like that. But, um, it, you know, I in the last, it was like four years and it was kind of crazy to see the growth that I've done locally. But... I started to kind of realize that, you know, locally it's been great, but I do find, and it's something that I'm very willing to talk about that, you know, the, the partying is great and the, and the partying and the drugs and the drinking and things like that is a huge aspect in our music scene, but I do find it a huge issue. And I really do feel that um, locally, like I've had even headliners come up and say it to me that they're like, yeah, I don't party like this in Toronto. I know there's parties like this in Toronto, but it seems that a lot of the aspect of getting into the music scene is, especially here, is is to party. And it was something that I had to come to realize that I didn't want to be partying. I wanted to really be putting it into my music. And I do find, I kind of call them lost souls, and that it kind of gets... A little bit I see so many people with some of the most amazing potential to be huge and you know they're getting they're getting older and they're getting all those kind of things but then I'm starting to realize how they party every single weekend and I started pulling away from that yes you know being someone that was partying and being a part of that party scene did get me to meet a lot of people locally but you know I, I do find that it really it was damaging and it was toxic and that I wanted to kind of pull away from that. And that was something that I learned um, that I, I think people when I when I DJ, they'll know of me that sometimes I do drink and sometimes I do have a couple drinks or things like that. But from places that I've DJ uh, locally, that they would know me that I was probably one of the most sober DJs they had there, even though I had like a tab to drink and I had all those kind of things. There was times that I'd be like, well, could I just use my tab to eat food? Like, I don't, like, I <laughs> love your food. Can I, can I use it for food? And, but it took me a while to pull away from that. I was, you know, I was partying, I was drinking, I was, you know, sometimes doing drugs and then would realize what made you that switch? I lost. What made me switch? I went through some hard, I'm going to say the word shit that like literally made me have to switch, you know, mental health things to, uh, just watching how my body was changing and how I was like, there was times that I was chilling with people and then it would be a Thursday night. I'd be off school on Fridays and then it would be Sunday the next, next few days. And I was like, wait, we just partied from Thursday to Sunday. And then it was coming to realize that even some of my really good friends that had like professional jobs and doing all these kind of things were literally spending all their money to come up and party 
and spending it on drugs and alcohol and all those kind of things that I just was like, I can't live this lifestyle. Like, I don't know how people do. And then I started to realize, you know, the people that are really, really wealthy or the people that are in the music scene and a lot of the, like, I look up to people like Lady Gaga and things like that, that were talking about the situations that they were doing it too. And they stopped also. They were like, you you can't live that kind of way. And when you think of some of the hard drugs that are out there and I'm a very spiritual person, but you, if you are doing those kind of drugs and what you're doing to your dopamines and what you're doing to your brain is mm. so bad. And I worked in harm reduction and I've gone through some really, really hard stuff with my mental health that I was like, I cannot be doing drugs like this and I cannot be drinking like this and I cannot be doing this because I would lose myself and I, I couldn't do it anymore. I was like, this is really, really terrible. And for me was that I was given, and I'll talk about it, something that was like really scary for me was that I was once given really bad acid and I did it and it ended up really fucking me up. And I ended up actually like almost, I, I ended up having to go to the hospital because it was so bad and that I thought I was gonna die. And that was the moment for me that, but I thought that was going to be the moment that I was going to stop this party lifestyle, but it wasn't that moment. I still partied a little bit more after it. Um, But then it was like, I was at school and I was like, wait, I want to finish school. And that I was noticing how I was first year of university. I did really well. Second year, I was caught up in this party lifestyle. And then I literally was failing classes and I wasn't doing the things that I was doing. I wasn't writing music. Well, it was like this like hit in the head. It was like a smack across the face that it was like, what the hell are you doing, Kennedy? And I, people started noticing it too, that I I wasn't going out to as many events. I wasn't doing the things that I was normally doing. Mm -hmm. And I really did kind of start pulling away from some of the, the local scene and things like that, just because of how much uh people were partying and people you know there's two different sides of yourself you have an ego side and you have yourself and your higher self and when you're putting alcohol and all this party aspect into yourself you're just living on an ego state and you're not actually you know you're not doing anything to heal yourself you're just covering it up with drugs and alcohol you're not feeling your emotions if something happens you're not feeling your emotions anymore. And that's what I started realizing that when I stopped doing all that partying and things like that, Mm -hmm. I came to realize, and I really started feeling my emotions and I was super emotional for a couple months. You know, I had PTSD from what happened on that acid trip. And it was like, you know, all these kind of things really affected me for a couple months that I was like, I couldn't believe how my mental health was and that I was, crying all the time, you know, I was mad, I was not a happy person. And then it was like, I snapped out of it. And I was lucky to, you know, get out of that kind of thing. But even to this day, like, I really, really want more people to, you know, understand what you're doing to your brain. And I want to be an advocate to living like a healthy lifestyle. And Mm -hmm. you can still go to the party, go have fun, go dance, go rave, go do all these kind of things. You know, if you it's all in moderation, but remember, you know, don't don't cover up your feelings from doing it and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Another rant. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I don't see it as a rant. I, I see it as mm-hmm. like uh, and, and that's why I really started this show, because like there are things that we might be handling or facing and um you know we might write in a journal but i think sharing it you know through a medium like this Mm -hmm. someone might be watching or listening and they might be like oh wait okay they might be going through something similar um they might they might that might just be what they need to hear to take the to take the leap to uh change their lifestyle around exactly like i look at like the artist of yishi you know, there's a lot of conspiracies about him and things like that. But the main issue in his life, like he ended up committing suicide. And he the biggest issue that he had in his life was the constant partying and the constant 
drugs and things like that. And it's really, really bad for you. And that's like, as much as it seems really, really fun. And of course you can have fun sometimes, you know, like there's no issues of doing that. And I don't condemn, you have to be this and this and things like that. But, you know, you have to realize what, what do you want in your life? You know what I mean? I, I started realizing, okay, going to, you know, spending $150, let's say, like put a number out on a night out, or I can put $150 into investments that are going to grow in a time period, like cryptocurrency or, or, you know, into my music or, or different things like that. And you can watch yourself start growing. And, you know, I want, I want to live a lifestyle that like I can travel the world and do my art. I want to live in a lifestyle where I, I get, to help other people and be a motivational speaker and, and talk about these kind of things and, you know, help other people. But if I want to do that, you know, like you got to have some sort of income and some sort of thing coming in to be able to kind of do that kind of stuff. And Mm -hmm. I started being picking and choosing what was important to me. Was that night out really important to me or was doing my music more important? And I had to pick. And uh, it's a hard, it's very hard, but it's fun. Everything, it's fun, like going out and raving and things like that. But it even came down to me in the idea of what even festivals I, I will be going to in the next couple of years and where I want to put my energy in different kinds of things. And it, it's about, for me, if you, I have it on my phone and it's like, I have to read it because I, I have it right on my phone on the idea of, this so let's say you put a shark it's like my background on my phone um let's say you put a shark in a fish tank it will grow um it will grow eight inches in that fish tank but if you put the shark in an environment that is growing that in environment let's say of an ocean it grows eight feet long many times small thinking people will grow that eight inches um while others who have big thinking and want big things will grow that eight feet change your environment and watch how your life changes and that's been something that is really stuck into my head for the rest of my life that it's like if i want the things that i want you need to be careful who what and what you're doing because if you are spending time with if you are doing these certain things you know you become that in seven years what do you want to become in seven years how do you want to help the world in seven years and you have to start realizing and picking choosing those kind of situations hmm. and where did you get that quote from or how did you um it was that the quote is actually something my grandmother told me um oh. about the who you become who you hang out with in seven years mm-hmm. and i didn't believe her when i was a kid i was like rah, 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 but they're, rah, they're my friends blah, 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 or whatever but then i started to realize it and i was like you know if you stick your life with people that may not be great for you you're going to become that in seven years like it's all about you know making sure you're putting out you know putting out good energy and being the person that you you really want to be and surrounding yourself with the right people and good people and i'm not saying oh hang out with famous people and and all those kind of things i'm saying it, it doesn't matter if they're famous or not it's about hanging out with people that motivate you empower you and make you feel that you're going going to do the things that you want to do and it's also a little bit you know hang out with people that know logical things and want to grow different kinds of areas and want to do those kind of things Mm. okay um so you do tiktok um and then you put up a post (laughs) yeah you put up a post the other day Mm -hmm. and uh, apparently it took you what four hours or two hours to put up i can't remember yeah but and it's funny yeah it, it took you hours to put out and it was like the river song i don't know what the title of the song is but the yeah. caption and i can't remember it for word for word now but it was like you had some traumatic event events experiences mm-hmm. and um this lifestyle helped that like is that something Absolutely. Let's talk about it. I'm so excited. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So there is a lifestyle. So my next song that's coming out. So I've done Pride, Greed, and Lust is the next one. So there is a lifestyle that I have been a part of. Um, and I have no problem talking about it. Um, some people get a little bit shy about it. 
but it's called the BDSM community. There is a huge community of it in Halifax. And to get the actual definition, I'll pull it up of what it is. It's pretty much an idea in life, in any, um, I'm just gonna get the definition. Uh, do, 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 do. So it's the idea of pretty much in any sort of relationship, let's say if it's a friendship or anything like that, in a romantic relationship, there is someone that may be more submissive in a relationship, and there might be someone that might be a little bit more dominant in a relationship. Mm -hmm. And this community has helped me understand different areas of my life. And, you know, it, it, there is a sexual side of it. You know, there's there's the different sides of people liking different kinds of things in sex and different kind of things and areas of that that they might enjoy. And it has helped, you know, when for me, uh, in this kind of area of life is that uh, BDSM, uh, when it came to me having issues of being sexually assaulted. So even when I'm DJing sometimes, I've had guys come up to me and be, I ask for requests and they're grabbing my ass and I'm sitting being like, why are you touching me? Like, and then I have to get them kicked out. Like you can't come up to me and think it's okay to come grab me in that way. And it's yeah. kind of that idea, you know, BDSM is all about consent and that if you are doing something, it is all consensual. Um, I consider it like a game being in um, a relationship. Um, it, there's different kinds of areas of who people are and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. And it is kinky. You know, there's people get tied up. People like, you know, people wear different kinds of outfits. People get spanked. People, you know, there's different fetishes and there's different kinks and things like that. And it all it's about accepting who you are and like if you think something might be you know a fetish might be weird and things like that you have a community of people that will respect you and understand you and and things like that and it's all about creating fantasies and creating areas in your life that can really help you you grow um a lot of it is people that are mess uh masochists so that kind of that pain and pleasure kind of end up mixing together uh but it also for me when it comes to the BDSM is that people actually think of it as only being um, sexual, but it's actually a role in a relationship, you know, um, being someone that has kind of been, I've been a very dominant person in a relationship and I actually was a dominant in a relationship for around three and a half years and it wasn't really a BDSM idea relationship. And I think, honestly, if I brought more of the BDSM aspects into the relationship, I think the relationship would have been a lot better and a lot more understanding and mm. would have learned a lot more and things like that. But when it comes to being a dominant, you are more of a, a protective kind of person. Mm -hmm. And now I've kind of, because I'm such a dominant role in my life as a DJ, as a musician, as things like that, when I come home, like, I also, and like some of the things I've gone through that like I really want to have a protection also, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Like I want to come home and feel protected. You know, people call, you know, sometimes people call like the dominant a daddy or like different kind of things like that. Or they call like a, a submissive, like a baby or a princess or, or different things like that. And it's just the idea of having for both people in that kind of role to have the areas of life that they're really good at, that is protecting, that is being more dominant, you know, taking control of different kinds of situations, you know, helping out and things like that. And right now I've kind of started, kind of started talking to a new person and um, I was a very dominant person in my life. I was dominant in my relationships. I was doing all these kind of things, that, but I felt like because I was a dominant, you know, I was a dominant in my work i was a dominant at school i was a dominant in this i was this that it was actually exhausting me and i was getting emotional and i was getting tired like i didn't want to have to plan everything i didn't want to you know have to do all those kind of things mm -hmm. but i now have someone in my life that i actually have been really enjoying that i get to be submissive and i get to be the one that gets a little bit more taken care of in that kind of way mm -hmm. yes in the sexual way there is different kinds of areas that can be interesting you know i posted a video of it and it's uh, a, a picture of someone dominating me and it's a video of being choked and kind of danced and thrown around and some mm -hmm. people i had to put a warning out because i do understand that a lot of people don't really understand the bdsm community and why people like it and things like that but those mm -hmm. kind of areas of it really helps people with ptsd there's so much research of it and 
it was really important for me for my next releases and for different things that I'm doing is to have it open up and have people explore it. And there's been a couple of my friends that um, were talking to me about about it. And I was at a dinner not long ago. And one of our, uh, this is like last Sunday, and two of my best friends are straight in the BDSM community. And we became so close because we all understood each other. We understood those kind of things, you know. We, we talked about the different sex toys we have, like all that kind of fun stuff. And uh, it was really, really fun. And But we started, a lot of our friends that aren't as, it's called vanilla. So it's like the idea of like there's BDSM, kinky, and then there's vanilla that mm-hmm. are not really a part of that community were asking us different kind of questions. And they were like, so, you know, he, if, let's say that like, you know, just thinking of a scenario, like it's kind of like a game too. It's like you kind of play in this kind of dominating role. It's like make me food, do these kind of things. And I find in different kind of uh, areas in relationships, like people don't, they don't have the same respect for each other. And they're asking questions being like, I need more respect in my relationship. And I want to get that. How can I get that? And we all, all look at them. It's like BDSM. Like you're going to be able to like... <laughs> Like, you want respect and consent and not to have these issues? Like, play the roles. Have fun with it. Make the relationship a little bit more fun. And and a lot of people look at me, they're like, you're submissive? Like, why would you, like, submit to anyone? And it's like, well, I'm not considered all submissive. It's There's different pronouns and ter- or not pronouns, I guess, terms in it. I'm considered a switch, meaning that I like to dominate and I also like to submit. And mm-hmm. I find it something that has really, it's been great for me to have that, but I also get to turn off my dominance. Uh, I, I don't know how freeing it is to say that, but I don't feel like I have to be in charge all the time and that mm-hmm. I need to, you know, if we're in a relationship, if I have to, you know, bring up all the time how we need to fix a relationship mm-hmm. and I'm dealing with someone that doesn't want to fix a relationship and things like that, you know, it's hard to have to dominate and try to fix everything and try to and try to do those kind of things sometimes, but some mm-hmm. people like that role and want to be that role and want you know to do that. They want to plan everything. They want to be in control of the situations and things like that. Mm-hmm. And knowing the difference of just different kinds of things, as I said, being someone that's been sexually assaulted, like it's helped me feel better going out with my dom, um, going out and having him as a protection and having that kind of thing. And And people sometimes like, Sometimes people will wear a little, like, for example, submissives wear like a choker on their neck or different kind of things. There's little like areas of it that make help people, you know, kind of understand it a little bit more. But some people will not understand it. And some people think of it as scary. And some people think of it as those kind of things. But Mm. it has been one of the most consensual thing parts of a community that I've ever been a part of. Mm -hmm. And people are like, well, I'm not sure about this. And I'm not blah, 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 blah. And it's like, well, no, like I've had less consensual issues, not in the BDSM community, like at bars and clubs and things like that, than I've had in the BDSM com- community. And I'm a very open person when it comes down to things, you know, I've been in crazy areas. I have gone, I have played at different, I've DJed at uh, kink parties and sex parties and and things like that. And it is an area of my life that I'm very proud to talk about and have no issues being open about mm. that kind of area. And uh, it's very big in many areas of, um, e- even in the music industry. And it, it's really cool. But yeah, if anyone has questions, I can explain it. And that's kind of the idea <laughs> of like- Yeah, no, no, yeah. <laughs> no, thanks. That was like a, like a quick snapshot of what it's yeah. about. Cause like yeah. most people, their experience of it is from that film that came out a couple of years ago. Fifty Shades of Grey. That one, yeah. Um, you know, because right. that's kind of like what people have an idea of. So coming from a real person, it, it's more like, okay, this is tangible. And um, we spoke, I know you actually have to leave soon. So I'm going to give you one last um, question, though. Yeah, I got like 15 minutes. Exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to give you one last question. Um, you know, now like you know making music and all these experiences you've had over the years um what things do you think you would change or what things actually not change what what are some of the lessons that you've learned Uh, over the years that have brought you to where you are now 
biggest lesson I've gotten, and it's something that I wish I learned four years ago, never let anyone tell you you're not good enough. Um, don't, you are good enough. Like I, anyone that's watching this right now, like you are good enough. And I want people to understand that, yes, take constructive, constructive criticism, take those kind of things. If someone's willing to help you take mm -hmm. the lessons that they have for you, but people are going to be intimidated by you. People are mm -hmm. going to be jealous of you. People are going to gossip and people will make drama. People are going to bully in the industry. And that mm -hmm. is something that I've had to learn for a long time and it really used to affect me but now I've learned to just you can think of me in whatever way you want to <laughs> like I it's like don't care anymore and um I really think if I learned that area four years mm -hmm. ago I mm -hmm. would be 10 times bigger than I am now and that's fine you know that's the lesson that I had to learn um the other one is everything in moderation um if you're going to go into the DJ world, or if you're going to go into electronic music, you know, it is known for the raving and it's known for this drug culture and it's known for those kind of things, you know, have your fun, but really, really look at the idea of what is important to you in your life and what you want to be and what you want to do. Don't yeah. get too caught up in toxicity. And the other big one I would learn is people ask me to, they're like, oh my God, like I can't, like, and it's something that I even learn is that when you're writing music and things like that, people expect you to have to sit there for like eight to 10 hours a day writing music. <laughs> but I, I'm i gonna tell you how incorrect that is. Um, If you, there is something I learned online that it's that in four hours, that is how long a, a, a violinist, like a professional violinist, let's say, she's playing or he or she's playing their their uh their instrument and they're sitting there and they only go for like two to four hours that is all they'll do a day why is that your focus and how your brain works and how well you can focus you can actually only focus on a task for that long so mm -hmm. if you can't do four hours that's fine but you can actually only focus on a task like really focus on a task for mm -hmm. two to four hours before your brain is like shuts off you know <laughs> um and i've seen it happen when i write music and the best way i explain it to people for writing music in any kind of genre i will write music for 20 to 40 minutes and then go take a 30 minute break or i might only get 20 minutes to an hour down of that day and then i'll go enjoy my day because that's how inspiration works you know you don't get inspired all the time you're not inspired all the time life throw stuff at you. You can't be inspired every second of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one, if you are at work, if you are anywhere, anywhere you are, and you are um, wanting to, let's say, you have an idea, let you have an idea, jot it down right away, because you're going to forget it. You think you won't, and you think you'll just throw it back in your brain. You won't. Write down that idea, have it on paper, and get it ready. Yeah. And nothing happens like this when it comes to even as I said doing a TikTok video it took us two hours to like do that video technically four hours all together to like do the production and it was like the little simplistic things of how like I had a towel behind my back so my dress looked like a certain way in that video and it's like those kind of things do happen and we it nothing happens just like that when it comes to creative work and, and all those kind of things, everything builds and everything takes time. But I believe in karma and the idea of that you put the effort in, you put the work in, you do those kind of things, the universe will open those doors for you. You know, Archie messaged me not long ago in a beautiful voice message, just being like, I'm so excited for your future. And why I'm so excited for your future is that the universe will just open doors for you when you start, when you stop leaving toxicity, when you start working on the things that you love, when you start doing those kind of things, mm. we are in a universe and the universe opens doors for you in beautiful ways. And I've even seen that. I'm 22 years old and sometimes I wonder, I'm like, how the hell have I done the things that I've done at my age? But it's mm. also in the idea of learning the certain things that I had to learn, the hard life lessons that I had to learn to become the person that I am now.
Yeah, that wow, awesome. <laughs> that's great. You know what? We have to do this chat again because I have so many things I want to ask. Yeah. But like, w- when I ask a question, you just lump it all. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, I'm going to go to that section and break it up. So I think I'm just going to like have just um episodes of the sanctuary where i'm just talking about a certain section because like there's the music there's the dancing there's the performance there's the like the kink thing there's the <laughs> we didn't even talk about like your management we didn't talk about the air and yeah. thing you're doing i do have i have nine minutes to so give any more questions we, we, like we don't have enough time and i'll show you that uh, but but I'm going to ask, um, you know, if, if it's okay with you, send you yeah. an invite to come back. So let's have another long chat again. I think oh, this I is the you. longest so chat excited. I've actually had on this show since it started. Uh, oh, but I yeah, it. thanks so much for coming to the sanctuary today. Thank and I can't you. wait to have yeah. you back. I really enjoyed it. This was awesome. And thanks for, I love the questions. I was like, yes, ask these questions. <laughs> I was so excited. So yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>